Hello everyone, how's it going? My name is Nathan and I'm so happy to be able to deliver to you a message from God's word. I hope that you're doing well today and I hope that you're gonna be able to take some time here, to really set this time aside to connect with God. What is he speaking to you through this word? Today we are looking at the book of Acts. We've been walking through the book of Acts for a number of weeks now and we're in a series called Living It. And our hope is that this is gonna be a word that doesn't just affect the way that we think, affect the way that we, uh, uh, what we've heard today, but it's actually going to be something that we can live, that it can be put into action in our life, that something about the way that we carry ourselves, the way that we go about our day, the way that we think about ourselves or others is going to change. So if you would, please, let's, let's prepare our hearts to God, I'm, I'm ready. Would you work on me through this word, through the thoughts that are going to be shared here today? And my prayer is that I'm not going to just share my thoughts, but really, truly, something that's on the heart of God. We're looking at Acts chapter 17, verse 16. So if you've got a Bible, open it up. Go get your Bible. This is part of what we do. You're at home, but this is your moment to be church, to connect with God. So get your Bible. Let's go. Let's do this. And as you're doing that, I'm going to share, share a story. This week, uh, I was getting ready to actually do a, do a church service here at 414, and I walked out the door to try a new coffee shop here in Hell's Kitchen in Manhattan. And I walked in, I was like excited to experience the new coffee in this place, and I just picked a coffee off their menu. They're like, here's our menu, cool, a coffee menu. I generally know it, but let's take a look. It was all single origin stuff. And he rung me up, and friends, I had a moment. <laughs> <laughs> because what I just bought was a $10 coffee. <laughs> this is the most like New York kind of thing that had happened to me in a, in a, in a minute. Uh, I went and bought myself a $10 coffee. I just balled out on some coffee there. It was very delicious coffee, but it was, it was $10. And that is not typically what I expect from my coffee. I don't expect my coffee to cost around the cost of, you know, a really good sandwich. So those are different categories in my head, but now they're getting blended all in together. And I was sharing with the dude, yeah, I'm a pastor down the road about to do a church service. He goes, cool, we're a bit of a religion here as well. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. That's interesting because I totally agree with that statement. What you're doing here is, is also a form of worship. It's a form of worthship. This is the etymology of our word worship, is worth-ship. What is something worth? And in that moment, I participated in this worship moment, paying $9.80, $10 for a cup of coffee. It was a brand new ex worship experience, worth-ship experience for me there in that coffee shop. For some that would sound reasonable. That's what you pay, Nathan, for a good cup of coffee. Isn't it worth that? For others, you're judging me right now for dropping that money. That's okay, I forgive you, I love you. Um, but we're gonna extend grace to one another here in this moment. The pastor paid $10 for a coffee, you can forgive him. Uh, you can, you can, we can walk together in this moment. <laughs> now, Paul is going to enter in, in this passage that we're going to read in Acts chapter 17 into a new cultural context where he's going to see a lot of worship activity happening. And Paul makes a judgment there. His spirit is provoked. Something happens in him. And what my hope is today is that our eyes will be open to all of the worship experiences that our culture is offering to us. And that as we view and observe this, we'd say, God, what worship is happening in my heart that you're not pleased with? Where am I judging the world? This is worth it. That is not. This experience for God is worth it. That one is not. This cultural experience is worth it. That one's not. Which ones are you saying I'm pleased with? And which other ones would you say we need to reorientate, rebalance the values that are in our heart? So God, we lift those up to you. Lord, I pray that you would be in charge here today. Speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Acts 17, verse 16. This is my one verse for today, or one verse from the book of Acts. We're gonna use it as a launching pad. Now, Paul was waiting for them 
That's Silas and Timothy. They've been left behind. They're coming on a boat at Athens. He was waiting for them at Athens. And his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. City was full of idols. He was provoked. I want to ask you a question. When was the last time you were provoked by idolatry? Perhaps you're saying, well, that was yesterday, Nathan. I saw idols and I was provoked. Or maybe you're saying, that sounds like a bunch of religious hogwash. That sounds ridiculous. What on earth are you talking about? Paul was walking through a pantheon of gods in Athens. It was a, a modern marvel when Paul was walking through it. The temple to Athena stands today as one of the wonders of the world. The beautiful incredible architectural masterpiece that people are still studying and marveling at today. How much more 2,000 years ago in the days of Paul? He was walking through and observing the absolute pantheon of gods. Over here, the God of making babies. Over here, the God of, of war. Over here, the God of great business deals. Over here, the gods of beauty and art and music and people were coming into this religious setting and lighting candles, sacrificing animals, laying bags of grain down at their favorite gods or the god that they need the help of this week. I need the business deal. I'm going to go to that, that guy. I'm going out to war. I'm going to go sacrifice to the god of war and laying their candles and their trinkets and their alms at these different gods. And Paul saw this. And there was something in him that was provoked, sharpened, spurred. His attention drew sharply to it. Perhaps when you've been frightened, your, your field of view narrows and you're acutely aware of what's happening in that moment. That's what Paul saw. And he said, these gods should not be worshipped. One God should be worshipped. One God's name should be called upon. And I know that God. And so Paul, in that moment, studies and observes and, and takes on board all the information he can, not judging these people because they didn't know any better, but then he delivers a message to them because his spirit was provoked. Will we allow our spirit to be provoked by what is happening in our day and age? Will we allow our hearts to go, you know what? This is not right in our culture. Paul was in a third culture. This was not his culture, but he had the audacity to say, this is not right. My God deserves to be worshipped here. And friends, can I just encourage us? The God that we know from the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who's revealed himself as the person of Jesus, he deserves to be worshipped in New York City. I don't care what other gods, or as Tim Keller would call them, counterfeit gods, money, sex, and power, identity, are here in this land. There is one God above them all. Can we allow our hearts to be re-pricked for the glory of God? Resharpened, refocused, re-provoked, and, and care about what worship is happening in our city. Because friends, when our, when our eyes are open, there are little gods, false gods, idols, Images of gods all over the place. And it's not just me who thinks so. Uh, Tara Isabel Burton is an author. She's a religious columnist for the New York Times, wrote a book called Strange Rites, New, Relig New Religions for a Godless World. And in it, just in her introduction, she chronicles some of what the new remixed religions, the re uh, religions of mixing and matching um, in intuitional religions that have taken the place of institutional religions in our modern culture sort of looks like. And she puts it out there like this. Again, this is not like a Christian writer necessarily. She's writing in more of a secular kind of context. And so she writes this, from soul cycle to contemporary occultism, from obsessive fan culture to the polyamorous kink-based intentional communities of our new sexual revolution, from wellness culture to uh, reactionary activists alt-right, today's American religious landscape is teeming with new claimants to our sense of meaning, our social place, our time, and our wallets. And if you've ever been to a yoga studio or a CrossFit class, ever 
practice self-care with a 10-step Korean beauty routine or a Gwyneth Paltrow sanctioned juice cleanse, ever written or read internet fan, fan fiction, or compared your spiritual outlook to a Dungeons and Dragons classification, lawful good, chaotic evil, your personal temperament to a Hogwarts house, ever clean, channeled your sense of cosmic purpose into social justice and activism, ever tried to biohack yourself or used a meditation app like Headspace, ever negotiated personal relationship rules, be they kink or ethical, ethical non-monogamy with a partner, ever cleansed your house with sage or ever been wary of a person's toxic energy, you've participated in some of these trends. There are more, just you wait. Tara Burton. So what we're highlighting here is that the pantheon of gods is not just something that Paul observed and existed in ancient Greece, but the pantheon of gods are here in New York City today. They are active. They are alive. They are teeming with brand new life in this day and age. And will we allow our hearts to be reprovoked by the gods and the promises behind those gods that are absolutely flooding our society? The problem here is not this list per se. If you've ever done these things, if you've ever participated in some of, some of these religious trends, some of these are clearly against um, some of the words of God. Ethical non-monogamy is not something that we as Christians believe in at all. God has called men and women to get married together forever. It's called a covenant. There is no such thing as ethical non-monogamy in a biblical worldview. However, if you've been into a yoga studio or a CrossFit class, does that make you an idolater? Well, it depends on what part of your heart that's taking up. Is it taking up? Is it consuming all of your energy and identity? Is it consuming who you are as a person? Has it entered from a good place of keeping healthy into an ultimate place of your identity? Identity. So if you fail as an athlete in one of these arenas, that you are a failure as opposed to you being eternally set as a child of God. Some of these are religious, Christian, ethical um, things that the Bible dire addresses directly. Other ones are going to be ones that we need to judge on a case-by-case -case basis. But the problem is not the thing itself. The problem that Paul had was not the idols. And he writes this to the church in Corinth later, after this missionary journey, he writes to them about idolatry. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 19 and 20, he says this, What do I imply then? That food offers to idols is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No. I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. I don't want you to participate with demons. The problem is not just that these things exist or it's that there are genuine spiritual forces that are calling people into lifestyles and practices that dishonor God, that are distracting us from true worship, that are distracting us from the one true God. That is the problem behind the problem. It's not that these things exist. They've always existed. Different gods have always existed. What I want us to open our eyes to is, one, that other kinds of worship exist. Christian worship is not the only kind of worship. There is worship in every marketplace. There is worship on every street corner. There's worship in every uh, gym. There's worship going on on every TV. How are we, our hearts, uh, interacting with the world around us? And is Christ paramount in our life day to day and moment by moment? Because he and he alone deserves the glory, the time, the attention, and the worship in our life. What are the other gods in your life that are competing for attention? And are we letting them win? Or are we continuing to supplant them by the true worship of God. A modern pantheon of gods exists today on social media. Social media is full of them, and if you just scroll through, we'll see all of the value systems of the world. All of these little accounts today are little more than public forums of our modern pantheon. 
They're little shrines to modern self-salvation efforts. If you work out enough, then you will be saved. If you're socially active enough, then you will be saved. If you live uh, investment, if your investments are smart and you live savvy enough, then you will have fire, financial independence, and retire early, and then you will be saved. If you clean your house well enough, then you will be saved. If you have beautiful kids that are well-educated, then you'll know you're a good parent, and then you will be saved. If you're a good mom or a good dad, you will be saved. If you're beautiful like these women, beautiful like these men, then you will be saved. The list goes on and on and on. But these things are nothing more than self-salvation efforts, idolatry upon idolatry, accounts where we stack up our likes and our comments alongside these little totems that in the end will only lead us to destruction. Friends, what are we worshiping? Are we worshiping something that is made by human hands? Something that's been made by humans that will not last forever? Or are we worshiping the God above all gods, the creator of all creators, the creator of all creators of other content that we consume? What are we worshiping? What are we spending our time on? Because there is only one who will fulfill, there's only one who will save, and there's only one who will love you unconditionally. Because any lifestyle, if you fail it, there's no coming back. But when we fail God, not only is there a coming back for us, but he actually comes after you. God is a God. Our God is a God like none other. He loves you. He loves you unconditionally. In this moment, maybe you're saying, man, I've not been worshiping God like I have these other areas of my life. My career has totally taken over. I've made a good thing into an ultimate thing. I've turned a good thing into my whole identity, my whole world. And maybe you're feeling guilt right now. Settle in. That is, the, that is not what God wants for you. He doesn't want guilt. Maybe there's been sexual practices in your life that you know are dishonoring to God and you feel such guilt and shame creeping in right now. Once again, that is not what God wants for you. Jesus died on the cross, one, to set you free, and two, to say all the guilt and all the shame is lifted off of you and it's onto him on the cross. So friends, in this moment, if your temptation is to fall out away from God, that is the wrong response. What this is supposed to do is call us into God, the one that loves you, the one that even when you fail him, he will never fail you. He loves you and he's intentionally for you continually. Our hearts are prone to wander prone to wander, but he, in his very nature, comes after us. John Calvin said that our hearts are like an idol factory. They produce idols all over the place. All the time we're taking good things like our friends, our family, our careers, our jobs, very good things, and turning them into ultimate things. It's not that God doesn't want you to have money. It's not that God doesn't want you to have a family. It's not that God doesn't want you to find a love relationship that honors him. It's that God never wants these things to become ultimate things above him. He's the author and the perfecter of our faith. He's the one that's created all of life, all of the love, all of the resources. Let's not be infatuated with his creation. Let's rather get our eyes off of his creation and onto the creator. In this past week, I was feeling a growing anxiety in my heart. My bank account was not as healthy as I like it to be. I had some outstanding bills, and there were just some things that were just unbalanced in my financial world. We'd traveled a lot. We'd gone, uh, done some vacation things as a family, and all of the bills were kind of coming home. Also, Ilsa and I were looking through Street Easy, looking for our next apartment. God, what do you have for us here in the city? Feeling the, the pangs of, oh, rent has kind of increased since the last time we were looking. And I was getting anxious about our financial situation. And that anxiety started to play out on Ilsa, getting mad at her spending habits. Of course, not my spending habits, her spending habits. My spending habits are okay, but they're, I'm going to hide those away so she doesn't have to see them. You know, things like that. It's really, really good Christian 
Christian ethics right there is how we should really operate with one another. And God kind of pricked my heart and said, Nathan, what that anxiety is, is it's a symptom of false worship. You've been valuing, putting your worship, right, on the wrong place. You've been emphasizing the wrong things in your life. Your anxiety is a symptom of worshiping the wrong gods. Nathan, you're putting a good thing. Yes, you want to be financially healthy, but the fact is, Nathan, I've provided for this. It's covered. It's just not the way that you want it to be. It's not the numbers that you'd like to be seeing on your electronic banking account, you know? It's okay, but Nathan, you're provided for. Who are you trusting in this moment? You're trusting this? Are you trusting your income streams? Are you trusting the numbers on the screen? Are you trusting the God who made it all? Ooh, because in that moment, it was clear I was not trusting God. I was mad at Ailsa. I was mad at myself. I was mad at our expenses. I was mad at our apartment. I was mad at the rent. Rather than trusting the God who is over all of it. In that moment, my heart had disordered worship. Disordered values. And God had to come in and start to sink his principles through my heart press his identity through my life so that I could worship him rightly and so that I could treat Elsa rightly, so that I could approach my finances rightly and think about all of it collectively together. God, you provide. You provide. You're my source. I, I believe very thoroughly anxiety is a symptom of disordered worship. I'm not speaking about anxiety is a symptom of uh, hormonal imbalance, clinical anxiety, but those pressures, those feelings that we have where we're overly worried about things in our life, it's a symptom of disordered worship. God has a solution when we're feeling these ways, when we're feeling like a loser because we didn't measure up, when we're feeling like a failure because somebody else exceeded us in our job, or we're watching a friend get married or experience a life thing and going, oh, I'm kind of resentful in this moment. That's a, that's a symptom of disordered worship. God has a solution for this yuckiness of our heart. And that solution is true worship. In Isaiah chapter 44, God is berating Israel for their idolatry. He's mocking them for it. He starts off like this in Isaiah 44, verse 9. He says, All who fashion idols are nothing, and the things that they delight in, they don't profit. They're coming to nothing. And then he goes on to talk about how somebody will chop down a piece of wood, use half of it to make lunch, and half of it they'll turn, a, turn it into a god. He's like, half of your god is now ashes. What does that make your god? And he starts mocking them for their vain pursuits. They're idolatrous, vain pursuits. And then at verse 21 and 22, God turns a corner. And he says, remember these things, O Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant. I formed you. You are my servant, O Israel. You'll not be forgotten by me. I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like a mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. God's saying, your hands have been so busy making idols, making things that, that affirm your identity, making things that tell you that you're someone, making things that allow you to feel good about yourself. But here's the thing. I've held you. It's not about what your hands have held. It's about what hands hold you. God says, I formed you. And even though your heart has been all over the place, I've blotted out those sins. They're no more. He goes on in verse 24. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, who formed you in the womb. I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens and spread out the earth by myself. All those resources that you're trying to pull to yourself, all that identity, all that security, 
all those hopes, all those feelers that you have out into the world, all that worship that you're putting out there. Here's the thing. God made all of it. And he made you. He's formed you. And he's saying your identity, your value, your hope is not about what comes out of your hands. It's about the hands that formed you. It's about the hands that reached into the mud in Genesis 1 and formed a human. It's about the hands that were involved in your mommy's tummy when you were in there that were putting you together. Your personality, your smile, your unique personality quirks, who you are. God's saying, I value who you are, not what you do. Would you just relax for a moment? Would you just return to me? Would you just come to me as you are, who you are? I've blotted out your sins. I've taken care of that. Would you return to a relationship in me and with me? Would you worship the creator of all the heavens and the earth rather than trying to worship the creation itself? Come back to me. What's incredible about those hands that have held me and have held you? So those are the same hands that received the nails of our sin. The same hands that would come down to earth in the form of Jesus and put the sin of this world upon himself. All of our idolatry, all of our false worship, all of our disordered loves. He would take those upon himself as we poured out our jeers on him. He would take the nails through his hands, the same hands that formed you, the hands that got nailed to the cross. The hands of formation now become the hands of forgiveness. There's only one God that has died for me and you. There's only one God that's loved us through our faithlessness. There's only one God that stands so for you. So friends, what do we, how do we respond? We worship him. We order our loves and we set our priorities with him as top. God, if you ask me to do this thing, it's going to hinder perhaps my love life. It might hinder my career. It might hinder my financial prospects if I follow God to the letter of the law. Friends, it's worship. What are our values? Where do we place our identity? Where do we place our security? What thing are we going to worship most? That's what it comes down to. In this pantheon of gods, in this diverse worship culture that we live in in New York City, there is one God that stands above the rest, and his name is Jesus. My call today is for us to wake up to all of the worship that is happening in the world and to value the one God who's loved you through it all, who's been there for you all the way. For some of us, we need to take a step to giving our whole life over to Jesus, to coming out of certain patterns that the Bible calls sin, it calls them not right, and start a new life with Jesus. He loves you. He forgives you. If that's you today, please text us. Our number is 844-962-3110. Text, I'm ready to that number. I'm ready to take my next step. Perhaps you need to get baptized. Text, I'm ready, to our same number. Perhaps you need to get into a connect group. Same thing, text, I'm ready. We want to hear from you. We are ready for you to take your next step. We're ready to journey with you in that next step as you follow Jesus. He's the one God. And so as there's all these other worships in our world, let's exalt the name of Jesus. Let's worship him. Let's value him. Let's set his words above all of the other words in our life. He loves you. He's for you. He's not against you. He doesn't want to shame you. He doesn't want to slap you around. He doesn't want to make you feel like a loser or a beginner. He wants to bring you in, lift you up, and elevate you, because that's his heart for his creation. Let's pray. God, in this world, there's so many things that can distract us from you, whether it's $10 coffees or things that we're seeing on our screens, ways that our careers are pressing in on us right now. But God, I pray that in our hearts, there would be order to our worship, that we'd worship the creator above the creation, 
that we would think of you more highly than we think of ourselves and our own wisdom and intellect. God, help us to order these things. I pray, Lord, that there would be a provoking in our hearts, that we be provoked by false worship. Say, that's not right. I'm going to make it right. Yeah, there's false worship out there. But God, start with our hearts. Starts with my heart today. Start with our heart today. In Jesus' name, amen.